been confirmed and indicates you are a speaker. Please star zero and your coordinator will begin your conference. As a result of the state's role, boundary, uh, we are um, working to its emergency regulations, and again, that's the purpose of today's webinar. We have to reprioritize basins. We provide technical assistance. As I mentioned, again, state evaluation and assessment, and that's specifically a, a Department of Water Resources role. And then there's that state intervention, and there, that being a role of the State Water Resources Control Board. So who applies to in which areas of the state? Lead probably on, on the slide, but as most of you are probably familiar with, the map of high and medium priority basins and then low and very low priority basins. The act specifically applies to high and medium priority basins. They're here in orange and yellow. There's 127 high and medium priority basins that represent approximately 96% of the groundwater use and 88% of the population. And as you can there's a time frame for accomplishing the, the act goals. So folks can't really read this slide. Um, I recognize that. This is a great document, and I think we've presented this before, that describes the major milestones and, and who's responsible for which uh, sections of the Act. And so I encourage folks, if you're starting uh, to become familiar with sustainable groundwater management, this is a great uh, single document to, to start that process. This document, this time, is available on DWR's website, and Stephen will point out where that is at the end of the presentation. And the red circle is just hiding where we're at, and we're dealing specifically with this webinar with basin boundary regulations. And I'll just mention there's the Groundwater Sustainability Program Draft Strategic Plan. This is the Department of Water Resources Plan, um, and it outlines the objectives and actions and activities identified in the Act and other activities that the Department uh, tends to complete to support sustainable groundwater management. Again, I know it can't be really easily uh, seen on this slide, but again, this is on our website as a draft plan, and we encourage comments by Janu uh, excuse me, June of, of this year, and specifically we're dealing again with that basin boundary regulations. So I will turn it over to Stephen Springhorn, and he will move through the uh, topic uh, of uh, interest. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. We, I really look forward to providing some additional details on the basin boundary regulations. And we'll look forward to getting input and feedback on this draft framework that will be presented today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, the operator. Have you pulled out on a separate line? Participant, can you hear me? Can you hear me? If your line is muted, you can press star six to unmute your line. This is your. The conference will be helpful for local agencies. Part of the presentation today. Chris and Trevor mentioned this already, is it's to pre present this draft framework for basin boundary revision regulation. And this presentation is a summary of a, a more detailed discussion paper that is available on our website at the following link. The other goal for today is to enhance DWR's understanding of specific stakeholder issues as they relate to the basin boundary regulation process and existing basin boundaries that currently exist. So now about groundwater basin summary and how basins are defined in the state. Some of you probably know what a groundwater basin is, but I want to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what groundwater basins and sub-basins are and how they're defined in the state, because that will be critical as we move forward with this process. So sustainable groundwater management definition of a groundwater basin is an alluvial aquifer or series of alluvial aquifers with reasonably well-defined boundaries in the lateral direction and have a definable bottom. 
So the schematic on the screen here is a good illustration of a bin boundary, a groundwater basin and its boundaries, where it's the boundary is the contact between bedrock aquifer material in the foothills or mountains and the alluvial aquifers of the valley or alluvial aquifers in the state. The sub-basin sub is a division of a groundwater basin into a smaller unit using geologic and hydrologic barriers or institutional boundaries. So the lower illustration shows the sub-basin boundary in red. And those sub-basin boundaries, as I just mentioned, could be along a river, say the Sacramento River, or a county or water agency boundary. And a key point between the two different types of boundaries of the groundwater basin or groundwater subbasin is the amount of groundwater that flows underneath or through those, those boundaries. A groundwater basin boundary, in many cases, there, it, it constitutes a, a smaller fraction of groundwater flow from bedrock aquifer material to alluvial aquifers. The groundwater subbasin is substantial water flows through these sub-basins. And that's where we'll get into later in the presentation talking about coordination as we move through the Sustainable Groundwater Act requirements uh, with mating between the adjacent sub-basins, coordination of sustainability agencies and groundwater sustainability plans. So I just wanted to give a quick real example of a of what groundwater basin we're in here in Sacramento. It's the South American Subbasin outlined in red. It is one subbasin uh, of many that comprise the Sacramento Valley groundwater basin. So I just wanted to give you an example of the groundwater basins and subbasins that are currently defined in the state. All those basins and subbasins are defined in DWR's Bulletin 118, and those things have been defined using the best available information at the time that they were defined. And historically, revisions to basin boundaries have occurred during Bulletin 118 updates under an existing water code authority that the Department of Water Resources has. The figures, the report figures on the lower part of the screen are the previous Bulletin 118 through time, dating all the way back to 1952 when groundwater basins were first defined in the state. And there are subsequent updates, and more basins have been defined using your information and higher resolution mapping. The current version of Bulletin 118 is the 2003 version. And there are 515 basins, and within those basins, there are 108 sub basins. Basins and subbasins are defined by geologic and hydrologic conditions and consideration of political boundaries whenever practical. The definition of a basin and subbasin gets back to the alluvial aquifers, as I described previously. So the on the right hand part of the screen are the five hundred and fifteen groundwater basins and the subbasins within. They cover roughly forty percent of the area of the state. And the, these basins were defined using statewide geologic maps as as many technical reports are, that have been done within all of these basins. The enactment of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2015, it clearly states that unless modified, the boundary shall be as identified in Bulletin 118-2003. So that's the point that, that the department plans to use the existing groundwater basin boundaries as they are now. And local agencies can use those boundaries moving forward uh, for ground sustainability agency formation and groundwater sustainability plan <coughs> development. For this new process that Sigma has created and what we're developing these regulations for is a process for local agencies to submit revisions to these, these uh, basin boundaries. The next topic I'd like to cover are the actual requirements in the law as it pertains to this new boundary revision process. So the government is required to develop these emergency regulations for local agencies to request and potentially, or for the department to potentially approve revisions to existing Bulletin 118 based boundaries. We are required to adopt these regulations by January 1st, 2015. 
2016, and there are instructions to local agencies on what type of information needs to be submitted. And local agencies is underlined there because the Act clearly states that all local agencies can submit revision requests to the department. So the public or private landowners would need to work with their local agencies to file a basic under revision request. The four key pieces of information that need to justify a boundary revision, one is information demonstrating the proposed basin can be sustainably managed, technical information that the boundaries and conditions in a proposed basin, location with interested parties in affected basins, adjacent basins, any other information DWR deems necessary to justify a revision. So the emergency regulations that we'll be creating will have clear instructions on and further detail what type of information complies with each one of these four components. The department is required to develop methodology and criteria on how to assess the information that is submitted to us for three elements. It is likelihood the new basin can be sustainably managed. Whether the new basin would limit the sustainable ground management of an adjacent basin or basins, and whether there is a history of sustainable groundwater management of groundwater levels in the new basin. So the project to use to implement these regulations is a phased approach, and it's presented in this slide here, where the first, we're in the first two phases of this project, where the first phase was the scoping of the project, notifying the Office of Administrative Law that we're embarking on this emergency rulemaking process. We've been collecting issues and, and potential challenges uh, that local agencies or stakeholders may, might face uh, using the existing basins and their boundaries. We've been coordinating with the State Board and California Water Commission on this project. The second phase is really what we're presenting today, and that's the draft framework for these regulations. And I'd like to get your feedback on this draft framework and also any other issues or challenges that that you see with the existing basins as they're defined now. Will you information that we have been receiving through our previous public list, list sessions and today to consider that information as we, we create a draft emergency regulations? We're required then to go out with an additional set of public meetings to present the draft emergency regulations and receive comments on the information from different advisory groups and the public. We'll then consider that information and feedback as we adopt or find the emergency regulations and adopt the emergency regulations, which require California Water Commission approval and submit a package of information to the Office of Administrative Law. So what the process looks like in, on a time is that we're in the first day of, of May in our last listening session. Use the information that we've gained through this, these listening sessions, as I mentioned, and today, to draft the emergency regulations. We plan to present those emergency regulations to the California Water Commission in July, and post that on our web that information on our website. We're then required to go out with the the, the additional public meetings in Northern California, the Central Valley, and Southern California. We'll the September to October time frame. We'll, use, we'll consider the information and feedback we get in that process and plan to have the draft final basin regulations uh, presented to the California Water Commission in October and adopting the final basin boundary revisions in November before the January 1st, 2016 deadline. Cover a summary of basin boundary issues or challenges that we've heard meeting with local agencies and, and stakeholders throughout the state. And this map shows a snapshot of, of where we've been in the state talking about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and talking about the basin boundary issues. And those are on potential state-wide basin boundary challenges or challenges to local agencies as they're moving forward with GSA formation and GSP development. We organize those issues into groups or types that we've heard common themes. The first are is governance, then are geologic issues, six compliance issues, and 
issues related to existing state programs. So the first issues we've heard or challenges are related to governance. And the first two bullets there are really related to having to coordinate with multiple political jurisdictions existing basin. So we've heard that example, if there are three counties or multiple counties in an existing groundwater basin, that might provide or a challenge or issue moving forward with, with, with SIGMA compliance. The one is tribal, federal, and adjudicated areas. They hold a special status and have different requirements or do not have requirements under SIGMA. So according with those, those special areas and areas that have to form GSAs, that is a potential challenge with coordinating that moving forward. And then the final one is existing planning, where the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act gives new authorities to land use plant entities and groundwater management entities. And that new authority was not in place, obviously, when the, the boundaries were defined in 2003. So that difference could be a potential issue or challenge. So the next group is hydrogeologic issues. I already mentioned that, that there, there could be updated information on these boundaries. Since the boundaries have not been updated since 2003, there are there is a lot of newer information, such as higher resolution geologic maps or technical reports available to potentially better define these boundaries. Management. There are there are places throughout the state that have their own sub basin designations that they've used a lot of resources and models or monitoring networks that reflected in the current version of Bulletin 118. The next two are related with pumping adjacent to a basin. So this is or in the and watershed areas where if there is significant pumping outside a basin boundary that affects the sustainable groundwater management within that basin. That could be a potential challenge moving forward or combine with, with, with SIGMA. And I know that the issues are facts that we've heard throughout our <clears throat> engagement and stakeholder process. These are not of yours interpretation of these issues. And why to we issues into the characteristics that I'll, I'll describe uh, in the next section. So moving on, the next issue we've heard, stream aquifer interaction, many of the current basins boundaries now align with rivers or streams. And so moving forward with with GSEs and quantifying a water budget, having to allocate recharge from that shared surface water feature could be challenging moving forward. And the last issue in this section is future boundary adjustments. We've heard that the department should not be making basin boundary adjustments once GSAs and GSPs are formed, but we've also heard that through that process of gathering information, there could be new higher resolution data that could better define a basin boundary. So we've heard both both sides of that issue. The sigma compliance. This gets into change to basin priority, and and the requirements come with that under sigma. We've heard that there are areas that. If a small portion of a, a basin is looked at independently, it might, might be a, a lower priority or decrease in priority, which would then remove requirements of, of sigma. Opposite of that is if a basin, a smaller basin, is combined with other basins or enlarged, that could increase the priority to medium or high and then require sigma compliance. relating to existing state programs. And this is broken into issues related to DWR as well as state and regional water boards. And one of the key issues related to DWR is the CASGEM or California Statewide Groundwater Elevation Monitoring Network program and compliance with that program, which enables local agencies to receive state grants. So if basin boundaries changes affect CASGEM compliance, that might limit that access to state grants. All basin prioritization, as I just mentioned, that basin boundaries, so we have a requirement through the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that any time a basin boundary changes, 
we have to reprioritize the basins in the state. So effects to state and regional water boards, if boundaries change, and boundaries change, there could be effects to existing basin plans and permits and water quality objectives. So I'd just like to show you the, the, one of the first case sessions that we'd like to get into the details on in the, in the listening session after this presentation relates to the issues. And the first question there that we'd like to get feedback on is, has DWR accurately summarized the types of boundary issues? And any additional boundary issues that need to be considered? And we'd like to get feedback on these questions um, after this presentation. So now into the final portion of the presentation, and this is where we'd like to get detailed feedback as well. The department's proposed basin boundary goal and potential characteristics. And as I mentioned, the issues that we have heard throughout the state, we try to incorporate those issues into these characteristics. To start the proposed basin boundary goal, this really stems from the new state policy in groundwater, as Trevor mentioned earlier, and new state policy through state and the California Water Action Plan is statewide sustainable groundwater management groundwater basins. That intended outcome. Our goal to achieve that intended outcome is that groundwater resources are sustainably managed within existing ground basin boundaries defined by Bulletin 118-2003. Unless telling reasons which are supported by two key pieces of information. The first, adequate technical information, and the second is broad agreement at the local level that these basins need to be changed and that this new basin or basin boundaries would increase the likelihood of sustainable groundwater management in the, with a new basin and would increase in adjacent basin. For our for draft framework and the regulations, try to align with, with this goal that we have, our, our, our intended approach. And the characteristics are intended to promote discussion on the potential advantages and disadvantages based on under revision. As I mentioned, this will assist in the department developing these draft regulations that are the requirements of SIGMA and our goal to achieve groundwater sustainability statewide. So you think of these characteristics as potential future criteria to justify a basin boundary change. And the department has an initial understanding on the advantages and disadvantages of each one of one of these characteristics. And I'll present today, but we would like to get input on your input on the advantages and disadvantages of each one of these characteristics. And another key point on these characteristics is as we go through them, key in that the department will be looking at the whole package of information that's submitted to us. And if if one of these characteristics will make or break a basin boundary revision approval. So just keep in mind as we're, we're going through this. So the first group of characteristics are broken into size and hydrologic characteristics. And I know there's a lot of detail on this slide, and there's additional information in that discussion paper. So I suggest that you are with that discussion paper and, and read that discussion paper because it has some it has these questions in there, but it has some additional background information. The first bullet there, basin adequately sized to maximize water management opportunities. The part of that's a potential advantage where a basin, if it's, if it's submitted to us, is replaced to the largest hydrologic and hydrogeologic contiguous aquifer area that includes multiple local agencies, and it's defined to maximize sustainable groundwater management management and mitigate undesirable results. Related to that, the second bullet, basin properly sized for development and management of basin budgets. Again, with a large hydrologic or hydrogeologic defined area that has multiple local agencies working within it, it's a potential advantage that local agencies could leverage existing resources to characterize and sustain and manage the water budget and sustainable yield which will be critical moving forward with the development of the groundwater sustainability plan. Bullet there, fragmentation of 
a contiguous groundwater aquifer system. The department feels it might be a potential disadvantage where an existing groundwater basin might be fragmented into a number of smaller basins, with each of those smaller basins potentially creating their own water, a groundwater model or designation of water budget or sustainable yield, which would require a lot of coordination and potentially conflicting results in, in those analyses. Second characteristic are related to governance and jurisdictional characteristics. The first bullet there, solely jurisdictional revisions. The government feels that it's a potential disadvantage for a basin boundary revision to come in that's solely a jurisdictional or political revision that is not coordinated with the other adjacent basin. The what is basin properly sized for GSP governance. We think it's a, a potential advantage uh, on this characteristic, and this one really gets into county involvement in, in the GSA and GSP process. And it's a potential advantage that Existing groundwater basins or sub-basins to match the alluvial portion of an entire county, assuming the entire reed basin or sub-basin is completely managed. And this is a potential advantage for a few reasons. It could leverage the existing groundwater authority of the counties. It could also maximize the new authorities provided to GSAs through, this, through SIGMA. This is not something the department will go out and do on our own. We do not plan to make large changes to the existing base boundaries by collapsing basins, but this is one potential tool local agencies could use uh, moving forward with, with implementation of SIGMA. What is scientific versus governance information? The department feels that it's a potential advantage that scientific information is given greater consideration than jurisdictional or governance information to justify a basin boundary revision. We realize there has to be a balance there with civic information to justify a basin, but also there has to be the governance component that, or the management component of that basin needs to be found as well. A few more jurisdictional characteristics. The department feels it's a potential advantage that basin boundary revisions do not create unmanaged areas. So this back to fragmentation where we feel that basin boundaries should not create unmanaged areas because that goes against the, the intent of statewide sustainable groundwater management and could potentially lead to state intervention uh, down the road if there are unmanaged areas that are not picked up by the county. The last one the well, characteristic is fragmentation to exclude areas experiencing undesirable results. The department feels this is a potential disadvantage and goes against the intent of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that fragmenting areas that are experiencing land subsidence or over ground overdraft would not lead to sustainable management in the term. The final group of characteristics is coordination. The first bullet there is basin under revisions developed through a stakeholder process. The department feels this is an advantage, and this gets back to our goal of broad local agreement for local for boundary revision. The coordination agreement, this is, so there are two types of coordination agreements. The first is between basins, so interbasin coordination. We feel that this is a potential advantage, and getting back to the point I made earlier in the talk that there's substantial groundwater flow underneath these sub-basin boundaries in many areas of the state. Coordinating between basins is very important moving through the creation of groundwater sustainability agencies and development of groundwater sustainability plans. The second of coordination agreement is within basins or intra-basin coordination. And the department feels that this is also a potential advantage and this type of coordination could actually be used as an alternative to basin boundary revisions. So there are a lot of flexibility in, in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act for GAs and GSPs to be formed within an existing basin. Questions that we'd like to get into the detail and, detail and get feedback from you are on these characteristics and the potential advantages 
advantages and disadvantages of these characteristics. So I've given you the department's initial understanding, but we want to hear from you how you feel on these characteristics. That these could be the potential criteria on how to evaluate basin boundary revision. And then the other question is, are there any additional characteristics that need to be considered while, before we move forward with this process? So if I'd like to wrap up with just some few steps and stakeholder resources. So this is the same estimate timeline that I presented earlier. Our milestone is presenting the draft emergency regulation in July. The next opportunity to provide input from public is the required public meetings on the, on the uh, emergency regulation. We'll then use that information and feedback to develop the final draft emergency regulation and then adopting those emergency regulations this winter. So some uh, stakeholder resources. I highly recommend that you check the Department of Water Resources Sustainable Groundwater Management webpage. On the page, it has all kinds of SG-related content. There's a place where you can subscribe to get on a SGM email list. So anytime the department has an update or notification related to sustainable groundwater management, you'll be notified. Many of the documents Trevor presented earlier on, the timeline, the strategic plan, all of those are on this sustainable groundwater management website, as well as a dedicated website for these basin boundary regulations. And so a link to this presentation and the recording to this webcast will be placed on this Basin Boundary Regulation website. And finally, the department has developed a water management planning tool. There's an interactive map that has a, a variety of different boundaries that you're able to overlay on the map of California. You can zoom in and out. You, there's an, an address finder where you can type in your address to determine what water basin you're in. And you can see the existing basin boundary lines as well as counties, water agencies, and a whole host of other boundaries that might be seen be considered moving forward with the process. And as Grace mentioned at the beginning, if you have any other questions or comments that we cannot get to today or have, have not addressed, please email that, uh, give us comments or questions to that email at the bottom of the screen there. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in today, and now we'd like to get into the listening session portion of this, this uh, presentation or meeting, and uh, we can go from go from there. I'll turn it over to Grace. Stephen, I'm actually going to ask Stephen to go back to that slide with the resources and the email. We have a number of questions come in so far, so thank you everyone who's, who has submitted the questions via chat. So I'm going to read off about three of them, and we have uh, Trevor Joseph and uh, Mark Nordberg as well as Stephen. Uh, able to answer questions and then also regional staff chime in um, as appropriate. So, so far we had a, a number of questions, um, as you can see from the chat message window. Uh, the questions have been on uh, what authority will DSAs have if, um, so let me rephrase this. So the specific question is, do low and very low priority basins who voluntarily have, start a GSA and develop GSPs, will they have the same authority and power as the mandatory medium and high priority basins? Um, technical question of, will the PowerPoint presentations be available online after this uh, webinar? I had questions on uh, what specific requirements are there for removing uh, basins Boundaries as defined, there, it seems that there's a lot of focus on adding boundaries or increasing a boundary. What is the uh, requirement to possibly remove a boundary or to draw it? Um, series of questions and comments around adjudicated basin boundaries. How will uh, GSAs uh, work with these uh, adjudicated boundaries? Um, format of the boundary request? Is that something that's going to be provided? And then um, CARE WM agency put in a basin boundary request. 
So those are the series of questions that have come in. I'm going to let the panelists answer that, and we'll be taking questions, um, questions as they come in. So can we repeat the first question, and then we'll go through those series of questions? So the first question was uh, if a low price basin voluntarily uh, establishes a GSA and develops a GSP, will it have the same authority and power as uh, a medium or high priority basin? Sure. Uh, as Mark Nordberg, um, so to address that, it, play the, the, the act applies to uh, medium and high priority basins, but the question, uh, this specific question, is if a very low priority basin uh, elects to form a GSA and then develop a GSP, um, can I, um, to, everybody has access to the act itself, the, te the text of the act. Um, that particular question is addressed in uh, section 107.20.7, uh, specifically uh, paragraph B. So legislature encourages and authorizes basins designated as low and very low priority basins of the department to be managed under uh, a GSP pursuant to this part. Um, so I would uh, answer that question is, you know, this applies to medium and high priority basins, but uh, a low or very low priority basin, yes, they can form a GSA, they can develop a GSP, and it, it's my understanding that they would then have to follow the same requirements developing that GSP and forming the GSA, my name would be they, they do have the same uh, and authority identified in the act as a, a medium or high priority basin. Uh, the second part of, of that section uh, says chapter 11 does not apply to that basin. Chapter 11 is, is specific to state intervention. Um, so should a, a low or low priority basin not develop a GSA and not develop a GSP, you know, their, their, their option well. Um, those very low priority basins could move forward with a, a slightly different aspect of ground management, and that's consistent with, I guess, what's considered at this point the, the older approach to groundwater management, the, the development of a, an AB 3030 plan, you know, which, which meets the SB 1938 and AB 359 requirements. Um, for example, as already occurred on our GSA notification website, there's a list of those GSAs that have already have been formed in uh, seven broader basins in San Francisco County, uh, low, or excuse me, very low priority basins, and the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission uh, has formed a GSA for all of those low priority, very low priority basins in San Francisco County uh, with the intent, I believe, to, to develop a, a GSP for one of those basins. So, this question is an easy one. Will the presentation be available on DWR's website? Yes, it will. Um, we will get it up there as soon as possible. Um, next question. Methods presented are changing boundaries so have focused on adding basin area. Are there specific requirements for removing portions of basins defined? Uh, if I understand this question correctly, the, the regulations will lay out boundary changes, and this might be most applicable as, you know, the boundaries um, are between the alluvial portions of, of uh, the, the, the alluvial uh, sediments and um, bedrock sediments, and the, the, bound, the regulations will allow for redoing that boundary if there's scientific information that we will also make available for revising those, those boundaries. So those boundaries could could go a, a larger area, meaning that there is alluvial area that's currently not mapped to basin, or or the opposite that that the department currently has the boundary um, properly uh, not not uh, characterized correctly, and that it's uh, currently shown into the bedrock where uh, there is no alluvium, and that would be then a change of the boundary uh, or a reduction potentially in the, the basin area. This question. This will also need to add methods for revising the boundaries of adjudicated basins. The regulations will not 
are actually revising adjudicated base boundaries. Those boundaries and adjudications are were developed by 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 that adjudicated process. Uh, perhaps the question we would the department support changes to an adjudicated basin boundary, meaning if there's a basin where a portion of the basin is adjudicated uh, and it's all mapped to one basin, would there be opportunity to subdivide that, if you will, into a sub-basin along the adjudicated boundary lines? Um, and that's, that's a question actually we have. Um, that really facilitate this format, but you know what are the advantages to make sub basin boundary to an adjudicated area? Um, because as it relates to the act, it would still then leave a portion outside of that adjudicated area that uh, would still need to be covered by a groundwater sustainability agency and a groundwater sustainability plan. Um, that uh, it's in a high and medium priority basin. So you know, we're, we're interested in more feedback on, on that subject. Let's see. Will process to request a reprioritization or basin boundary be a standardized format? So the process to change a basin boundary will be a standardized format as written in the regulation. So the regulation will be the rule of rules of the game where it'll tell it'll describe the type of information that is required to justify a basin boundary change and it also talk about the criteria that will be used to assess that information. As to reprioritization, I mentioned in the presentation that the the new law requires that any time a basin boundary is changed, the basins need to be reprioritized. So it is now Part of the basin boundary revision process, so the basin boundary revision process and the prioritization process are now linked. Next one: Can IWM agency request a boundary revision? The answer to this is yes. If the agency is a local agency, so the, staff, the law states that any local agency can request a basin boundary revision. So I would say the answer to that is yes. So we have another series of questions come in, and those are related to um, will there be reevaluations of the can priority for a new base, a, a new sub basin? Um, to say how will a new sub basin be reevaluated for the CAS gem priority? Uh, we heard some of that in our uh, public sessions. You know, how does the group? How, did, how will DWR assess uh, those potential changes if a, group, a, a sub base extends and becomes larger or contracts and becomes smaller? How does the CAS gem prioritization work out? So, any basin boundary change that occurs, we have to reprioritize all, all of the basins. So, there is, I see this kind of as a part question. There will be reprioritization. Reprioritization of all basins, um, basically basin boundary change. Um, it, it's unlikely that that prioritization, reprioritization, will cause any higher medium basins to drop into a lower or very low category. And one of the characteristics, Stephen, is we are don't think it's an advantage to to make basin boundary change that um, removes anybody. From the obligation of CAGEM, or if that portion of the basin is currently unmonitored, uh, I think that that's that's not in the spirit of of of, this, of the. The other question that came in was: um, Can a local agency whose boundaries partially cover a groundwater basin? Uh, SA, a uh, groundwater sustainability agency um, for the entire basin. Better see that question. 
Okay. Uh, that was right here. So the question, can a local agency whose boundaries are partly... I believe that is... Uh, ambiguous or is that counterminious? Okay. Well, I'll answer it this way. Um, high and priority groundwater basins develop GSPs. And with those high and medium priority groundwater basins, and I include sub basins in this as well, you know, locations within those, those basins to be formed. It could be a way that covers the entire basin or sub basin that develops one GSP. There be multiple GSAs formed within that basin or sub basin that coordinate together and develop one GSP. Uh, the other option would be multiple GSAs being formed, basin or sub basin that develop multiple GSPs. We get to that as those multiple GSPs have to be uh, developed under a, a, an intra basin coordination agreement to make sure that their, their plans are submitted. Um, with certain assumptions that uh, align with each other, you know, data collection, data management, you know, modeling assumptions, uh, groundwater basin budget assumptions, uh, the list goes on. Um, in those high and medium priority groundwater basins, if there are portions of the basin that are not claimed by a local agency, uh, you're calling those white spaces, uh, gaps, for example, um, the, the default option is that the county then picks up those unmonitored areas within a higher medium priority basin. Um, should June 30th, 2017 come around and there are unmonitored portions of a higher medium, high medium priority groundwater basin uh, that are being monitored by a, a GSA or assumed uh, risk stability by a GSA, uh, and he elects not to manage those portions of, of the sub basin or basin. It falls upon the, uh, the jurisdiction of the intervention clause in the Act, uh, which is described in Chapter 11. Uh, the Water Resources Control Board then would uh, have the opportunity to come in, and work with the county, work with other local agencies uh, to figure out how to move forward with those unmonitored parts of the basin. So, I guess, uh, if I understand the question right, um, only parts of a high medium priority basin or basin need to be covered in one shape or form by a, 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 a low agency that's for GSA, a kind of form of GSA, or a uh, management by the state board. Okay, we'll jump in. It looks like the next question is, what is the standard for establishing local support of a proposed revision? This is, is kind of two-part. Um, one, the local agency can submit a basin boundary uh, post change request. Therefore, we think it's pretty important and that there needs to be agreement amongst any local agency that has stake or affected by that basin boundary change request. Obviously, there's a, a basin boundary change request made by a local agency, and it immediately uh, impacts then somebody on the other side of that, that, that change or if it's being subdivided, there has to be an agreement that that change is, is reported. And so there will need to be some sort of, and we'll spell out in the draft regulations, of course, but a, some sort of letter of intent or support that that is, that is accepted by those local agencies. As to other stakeholders, um, you know, we, we recognize that it's impossible to, to make everybody all the time, and so there's to be definitely stakeholder involvement. There needs to be some sort of means um, and um, and to stakeholders, uh, it, but that uh, that a, you know, 100% consensus from other stakeholders we recognize is, is impossible. And so we'll spell that out in a little more detail in the Act or in the regulations, I should say. So there was a question about what's the process to clean up existing boundaries in the Bulletin 118? Yes, that's a good question. So that is in the discussion paper. And as I mentioned in the presentation, that the boundaries have, have always been 
create the best available information at the time, but the last time they've been updated was 2003. And the department knows that there are some issues associated with the exterior and interior bound basin boundaries that don't match the written description that's actually in Bulletin 18. So the cleanup, or as we could call it, an administrative adjustment to the lines would be matching the, the GIS line work or the lines to the written description that's in Bulletin 118-2003. So we see this as essentially having two phases of, of cleanup. The first phase would be these minor ad adjustments where right now there might be the base boundary line might be designated on a count line, but if you look at the map, it's off, it's shifted, and that could just be a, a technical error in, in when it's digitized back in 2003. So plan to, to snap that line to an, a interized level data set of county layers as also river layers. There are a lot of basin boundaries that are on rivers that now, if you look at that, they don't line up, and it, that causes a number of slivers to form. And our goal with the cleanup is we want local agencies to start fresh with with the fresh data set of what lines should be. And those local agencies can can, can work on those clean data set and submit revisions based on that cleaner data set. So the second phase of this cleanup and it's to the extent of alluvium or the geologic map that's used to define the extent of alluvium of the basin. And as I mentioned in 2003, there was a statewide geologic map that was used to define or digitize these lines, and it was at a fairly coarse resolution. So in the last 12 years, there's been a lot of updated information and in higher resolution mapping done. So the department is going to be doing a lot of legwork in trying to catalog all of the newer geologic map information and we'll provide that to local agencies. However, we feel we should not be making those extent alluvial aquifer boundary changes before the regulations are out. We want to work with local agencies to make those types of changes because those types of changes could define who is in or out of, of Sigma compliance and we feel that local agency involvement in that process is critical. Pardon us experiencing a technical difficulty. Okay. Um, what? You're showing. It's not showing. Try again. There it is. Okay. Okay. So the next question is, how will DWR address public access uh, for DSAs created by uh, private water districts? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, GAs are only formed by uh, local public agencies. Uh, again, referencing uh, the code uh, addressed in, in section 107.23.6. So the combination of local agencies may form a, a GSA by using the following methods, uh, either a GPA, uh, item of agreement, or another legal agreement. Uh, item B says a water corporation regulated by the Public Utilities Commission may participate in a groundwater sustainability agency, a GSA, if the local agencies approve. So to summarize that, uh, a GSA can only be formed by a local agency, and local agencies defined uh, by a public agency that has water supply, water management, or land use authority. Um, a, public, or, uh, a municipal water company uh, can be part of a GSA, but to have the approval to be part of that GSA by local agencies uh, that are forming it. Um, like there's how public or uh, private water companies can interact with GSAs. Um, you know, as GSAs are forming, uh, you know, there's also requirements in the Act about um, consideration of, of all interests, of all beneficial uses and users of groundwater. 
That's described in, in Section 10723.2, and they list uh, all the, those those um, lists that she considered by the DSA, and, and I won't read the list to you, but um, it definitely involves all the stakeholders that, that have a stake in the game with respect to groundwater management. You know, that includes uh, you know, fences, although they're exempt from the Act. That includes uh, California Native American tribes. Suggested that that, that GA uh, work with Native American tribes with respect to their their management goals. Um, so I'll cover. There's a I guess while we're addressing some some technical difficulties, um, there was a statement that was made that was intended for counties to be the GSA. I think heard that uh, just a few minutes ago. It intended that local agencies and definitely counties are a local agency to be the GSA. But doesn't specifically call out counties. Looks like one of the next questions: What will be the process for a basin when change boundaries to quest a prioritization change from medium to low? So, if I understand this question correctly, there there is there is no process for changing your prioritization or basin's prioritization from 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 high to, to medium or medium to low or, or low to very low. Um, we're speaking simply only about the change that's allowed in the Act for proposed basin boundary changes. After those changes occur, the department will reprioritize the basins. There will be a public process during through, through that process that that was done previously under the CASGEM uh, program, but but there will be an opportunity for for a local agency to to make that that change. Themselves. Question If a local agency's boundary is smaller than its basin boundary, may agency become the GSA for the entire basin and adopt a plan regulating the entire basin? May local agency regulate beyond its own jurisdictional boundary within the overall basin? You know, this is a this is a good question that we've gotten a couple of times, uh, and you know, honestly, this is more of a agency should should work with their council and determine what's possible through different methods of of MOUs or JPAs. Um, it's not the department's role to specifically uh, answer answer this question. And there was clarification to one question. To read the answer to, will the process to request a basin boundary vision be put into a standardized form or application? And the question to that is yes. So we require that, that the local agency submit a packet of information or application to the department within a window of time. And so instructions for that, what needs to be in that application, will be in the regulation. to take a moment and ask the group, are there any um, input questions or comments on the characteristics as Stephen presented earlier, specific basin boundaries that people want to share or are there other characteristics that they want to add? Um, let's take a moment to see if there's any question on that. We've had a quite a bit uh, about Adjudicate boundaries, can a GSA um, firm for the entire region, um, if, the, if the agency only has a small port of that, etc. So, we had a few questions come in. Is there anything else specific to that? Uh, please type in your questions via the chat window so we can get that. The question around the timeline when will the bars first? "Quote unquote cleanup of boundaries be available for review, and can comment letters uh, to be submitted until the first cleanup effort has been published?" 
estimated timeline for the initial cleanup, to, well, as I characterize it as an administrative adjustment to stop the lines to where a, a quote unquote should be. That we plan to start working on that process now, and we plan to highlight those types of small adjustments in the next series of public meetings in the late spring, or the late summer time frame, in the September October time frame. Clarify that that cleanup, we plan to open up the lines where we have definitive statewide data that has accurate metadata, so that could, that's count lines and there are some other designated basin boundaries that are defined in the description of a boundary that we do not have definitive GIS data for. An example of that is water agency boundary. So we do not have definitive GIS data. We will not be making those types of cleanup or adjustments. Was, will groundwater quality be allowed as a basis for basin boundary revision for some boundary revision request? Yeah, that yeah, the way I understand that question, um, no, likely not. We're interested in scientific information, whether it's surface geologic maps, surface geologic maps, um, maybe um, drilling information. Other uh, geology information that supports that a basin boundary uh, change uh, should be made as it relates to the contact between the alluvial portion and the, the bedrock. Um, other changes we're discussing today, of course, include jurisdictional changes um, where there would be more of a subdivision or of, of a basin uh, to allow maybe potentially some basin boundaries. Um, and that would be based on other uh, methodology. And one thing to add to, to Trevor's comments is that by fragging off a portion of a basin that has water quality issues, that, that that's on one of the characteristics that we, we discussed that could be a potential disadvantage. Uh, and as water quality is an undesirable result in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, that could be look at as fragmenting a basin to exclude an undesirable result area that an undesirable result is occurring in. About how to do, how to resolve dispute between uh, basins, put simply between the basins, uh, one, it seems like one way of doing that is to create sub-basins. But they're very curious to know what's the DWR want to or can provide assistance for resolving conflict between uh, basins. Yep. So, with respect to, to the Act, you know, DWR does not have any authority with respect to governance formation. You know, just I'll put it before I'll say it again. You know, in those higher, medium priority groundwater basins. You know, a single SA or multiple SAs uh, need to be formed for the entire part of the basin. Yes, uh, this meant assume there's going to be disputes between local agencies regarding GSA formation, and we're in the process of receiving those notifications. Uh, the department has a very limited role with respect to GSAs. That's when a, a GSA is formed, or whether uh, there's a resolution of an intent to form a GSA. Uh, the local agencies have 30 days to send that notification to the department. The department has 15 days to post those uh, GSA notifications on our website. Uh, we've been doing that. Um, and then in the code, it says that uh, if no other GSA is formed for that particular area within 90 days, local agency intending to form a GSA is presumed to be the GSA for that area. But again, where there's conflict, if uh, another GSA that, that, that submits something after the 90-day period, 
and then we now have kind of overlapping governance structures. Um, the department does not get involved in that uh, directly. That's an agency issue to resolve. But what we, we can do and what we're in the process of, of developing, more information should be coming out probably in the next few weeks, establishing some contracts to offer facilitation assistance. Uh, we'll identify a process that local agencies can request facilitation assistance to the department uh, that the department would then uh, pay for. And that facilitation, just like CCP is facilitating uh, you know, this webinar right now, uh, the CCP, as well as uh, another contract we're working through can provide facilitation assistance to local agencies to work through some of those extremely difficult uh, decisions. And then I'll just, at the risk of repeating, I'll just add that the Act just doesn't give the department, and specific it's Chapter 4, authority to resolve PSA issues, as Mark was, was describing. Um, but facilitation, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, that's one of the technical assistance items that uh, we can provide to help uh, local agencies and stakeholders work through that process. And it should be noted that the if, if, if there's overlap or unresolved GSA issues, you know, we'll come to a, a point when our sustainability plans need to be developed that there will be um, some, some issues at that time that the department then will do uh, evaluate as we're evaluating those groundwork sustainability plans. An example of that is if the overlapping GSAs and they develop overlapping plans and they have um, you know, perhaps, uh, different water balances or budgets, at that point, uh, through the GSP regulations, that's when the department you know, plays a role in, in evaluating and assessing those, those issues. And it came in kind of revision be requested based only on higher resolution geologic mapping. I would suggest, but the fact is that the basins as they are defined now used one to 250,000 scale, so it's fairly coarse. So there are additional higher resolution maps or many higher resolution maps that, that could be used to update a basin boundary. and, and Part of the instructions we feel in these regulations should be we need to have confidence in where that, that, that new basin boundary is if we're redefined. So that includes written description of the basin boundary and then a IS of that written description at a certain level. And we're still working through the details on what level of, or what resolution that GIS coverage or map needs to, to have, but and that, that information will be in, in the regulation. We've had another question come in about can the basin boundary include other groundwater sources like bedrock and into the alluvial basins? That is very clear as, as it's written into the law that the definition of a basin is an alluvial aquifer or stacked series of alluvial aquifers. And that was specifically used by the legislature when they passed Sigma or when Sigma was enacted. So we, we will use the, the definition of a basin as alluvial aquifer and not including bedrock type aquifers. However, the definition of a basin states that the level extent of the alluvial aquifer is reasonably well defined. As Trevor mentioned previously in this Q&A session, if technical information that suggests that the alluvial aquifer is better defined or using technical information or higher resolution map, that type of adjustment could be made based on higher resolution information. It looks like there's another question as it relates to specific, you know, geologic Units and uh, whether there's maybe consideration for uh, sedimentary rocks, um, and so I'll answer that as I understand it. That you know, Stephen was mentioning the alluvial portions or stack series uh, 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 portions of alluvium are fairly clearly defined in Bulletin 18. Uh, there's some recognition though that if the 
basin boundary is not well defined, and there is um, pumping in rock that is, is, excuse me, not rock, but but sedimentary or alluvium that uh, is currently outside of the basin boundary, and, and we're not referring to bedrock here. We're talking about other other types of uh, sedimentary rock, um, and pumping that in the perhaps example might be volcanics, um, limits the basin's ability to reach the stability, that that is something that we would uh, consider uh, as a potential uh, basin boundary change. But I just want to be clear, we're not suggesting that we're um, extending basin boundaries up into bedrock formation. Um, we did that. One, it would be inconsistent with the definition uh, provided in the Act, and two, you know, it almost could uh, be uh, taken to the nth degree and, and cover almost every portion of, of California. Can uh, Klein GSA indicate that it will only cover a specific geographic area, you know, such an area within a specific county, and not cover the portion of a Bolt 118 base in another county? So again, uh, how GSA is formed is, is completely left up to local agencies, and that the, the, uh, the geographic area that a, a GSA uh, proposes to manage is left up to that local agency. So if a GSA wants to claim, you know, all the the, the of a basin within its jurisdiction, it, it can. If it only wants to claim a portion of its jurisdiction in a specific county, it can. Um, but again, the, the area. That local agency proposes to manage uh, under the Act is left to that local agency. And again, again will happen if there are, are competing areas. You know, for example, if a, a J is formed in multiple counties, and the county, for example, then submits a notification to, to claim all of the, the groundwater basins within the county. Then we actually have some some overlap with regards to proposed governance, and that would be those local agencies then then work together to to figure out you know a, a, a workable governance structure for sustainably managing the basin and moving forward with Sigma. So you know a couple of things here. We're getting a lot of great specific questions, and that this is really good. A little challenging to answer kind of on the fly, but we appreciate these specific questions. I do want to get back to Grace's um, thinking of, you know, if, are there questions specifically issues and characteristics? Uh, we're, you know, very interested in those. But uh, again, these are these are good questions. One question related to known and defined channels, and uh, I'm going to put our regional office person on the spot, Tim Ross. If you're online, Tim, you did a great job answering this question at a meeting we had earlier this week. If I hear crickets, then I'll do my best to. To answer, I'm wondering if, if Tim could could give an answer on known and defined channels. Okay. <clears throat> um, my understanding of the, the Sustainable Groundwater Act, um, it does not change um, for for water. Um, Whereas in a known and defined channel, it falls under uh, the same uh, jurisdiction of the state board as surface water. And so appropriations need to be made. If you read the question right, um, there's uh, a portion of a basin uh, where the water underneath uh, a river is uh, jurisdiction of the board. And I don't know that basin very well, so I don't know if there's area outside with the groundwater basin uh, we'd have percolating groundwater that's not under the jurisdiction of the board. So it's a little bit complicated there. But the, the basic idea is that it's under the board's jurisdiction on uh, a known and defined channel. That uh, regulation and, and process does not change with respect to uh, Sustainable Groundwater Act. I think we saw there were some regional board, or excuse me, some State staff at the uh, at one of the meetings, and they were they were shaking their head, confirming uh, your response. So I appreciate it. Next question 
when GR uses the term alluvial in the context of aquifers and boundaries, is it speaking of quaternary alluvial deposits to alluvial deposits of any age? So I would I would defer this question to bulletin the current bulletin 118. There's a lot of information in that bulletin 118 on this specific question, and so it. It's page 87 through the several pages, right? Specific on what, what bulletin 118 finds alluvial um, aquifers, and that bulletin 118 is on our website. Close at the bottom of the list here. Thank you for seeing more questions, Grace. I was going to ask if uh, people have any. Lots of questions, comments that they want to submit via the chat. Now is a great time to do that. As mentioned, if something comes to you after this webinar, there is the email address available uh, to send questions to or comments to that, that DWR is monitoring and, and uh, will take information under consideration. Um, we had a question come in. It says, here Central Coast, we have uh, unconsolidated or, or weak weekly completed marine deposited sediments that are commonly part of a, quote, defined, end quote, groundwater basin. And some proportions of these basins are offset by and placing, thank you. Would areas be eligible for this as a sub-basin? So that's a good question. And a lot of basins, particularly in the, the central or southern part of California, Basin sub sub basin and basin boundary lines are on fault already, and so if Tim Ross is is still on the line, I think he could give some insight on how faults have been used as sub basin or basin boundary lines. The current version of Bulletin 118. Okay, and in uh, Southern California in particular, there are a lot of faults that the cost uh, were originally mapped in the 1950s Bulletin 118, 1970s Bulletin 118 as very large uh, groundwater basins. Actually, they were split up into sub-basins, uh, mainly on hydrogeologic boundaries, and a lot of those boundaries are faults. Um, the question uh, that I read it is, uh, can uh, uh, marine uh, sediments be considered uh, part of a basin or separated from a different, uh, potentially different, different an alluvial ground basin as as a sub basin? Um, my thoughts are that, that uh, will setting that sub basin help in the management, the sustainable management of, of groundwater basin, both in the new sub-basin that you're talking about, as well as the rest of the, the basin um, out of that sub-basin. And so um, what technical information uh, you know, that, that provides a reason to split it away from a rest of the basin, and how will that Help with management of that groundwater basin. That's what I would be looking for if, if that information came came to me. I was going to try and make a decision as to whether that was appropriate subdivision. Thank you. So we are approaching the 1:30 mark, and if there are any other questions specific to the basin boundary issues or characteristics, any other comments that you'd like to submit. Uh, via the chat, that would be super helpful. Uh, we will have an opportunity to take a quick uh, tour of the DWR uh, Sigma website. And so feel free to send in a question or a comment via the chat as we navigate there. And Stephen's going to give us a quick tour. And I believe we're going to try to see if we have anything else come in. And if not, we'll do the tour and then we'll adjourn. Okay, great. So this is the Sustainable Groundwater Management website, and you, how to that if 
from the page of DWR is on issues, plan sustainable groundwater management. And as first thing has is announcements of all the current, issues, current topics uh, related to sustainable groundwater management. So it has the California water plan update. There's a tribal government meeting. It will take place May 7th. So this is sort of current events as it relates to DWR's sustainable groundwater management implementation. As tried at the, in the presentation, the sustainable groundwater management draft strategic plan is available on this site. And then to a California statewide groundwater site, as you can get activities that the state board are doing as it relates to This is your links to all of the pertinent information related to Sustainable Ground Management Act. It's in Boundary Regulations page is here. It has the discussion paper. Outline bulletin working basin boundaries as it's written in the law, and then timeline. And so this and contact information if you have any questions or comments. This page stated to include the presentations that were given today and the recording of this WebEx, as well as new information that comes available, the draft regulation will be posted here, as well as the, the final regulation. Main topics on this page, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency page has an, a lot of information on GSAs formation of GSAs and the different roles of DWR and local agencies. This is a table of GSA notifications we've received to date. Searchable table, you can type in which county or groundwater basin you're interested in. Click the information here and you get the whole package of information that was sent to the department to, to form a GSA. I just want to add a, another question came in about creating a listserv for GSA notifications. Steve, you kind of hover over where our, our listserv is. Um, it's for email updates. Um, for those of you that, that want to be updated, you know, not only with information specific to GSA formations, but with anything you know, uh, of notable uh, importance with respect to Sigma, uh, plan up to that. Um, you know, specific to GSA formation, that if you know, Stephen will click on the GSA notifications table, uh, we have five GSAs so far formed. Um, I've got several more I received this week that will be uh, posting uh, in the next several days. Again, after we receive them, we've got 15 days to post them. Um, you know, and again, this table, you know, we may modify it in the future as we get dozens, if not hundreds, of GSAs. Formed. Uh, for the moment, I think this works real well. Then you can sort by the name of agency. You can buy basin or sub basin name. You know, in many cases, a particular sub basin or basin may have multiple GSAs overlying them. We're working on, on developing a, a, a map. That might be a, a good opportunity to go to our water management planning tool um, if you're done kind of with the, with the tour. Um, the map will include uh, a layer of GSAs. Um, we've re been requesting, although it's not required, we've been requesting that when a local agency uh, submits a GSA notification to us, um, obviously are, are required in the, in the Act to identify the basin or the part of the basin that they're proposing to manage. Uh, but we'll all be developing a, a, a layer on that water management planning tool where you can go and see the, the general boundaries of GSA formations. Um, the map will be developed uh, in the near future. And as with the groundwater, or the water management planning tool, it, this is the interactive map that I discussed at the my presentation. So there's an interactive map of, of uh, California with a number of basin boundaries on it. So there's county boundaries. There's an office service areas, so the different region offices throughout the state. 
And as it relates, there's the Bulletin 19 basin. And you can reduce trends so you can see where in California or the cities where these basins are. If you click It'll have been, and there's a description, the bullet, the bulletin 118 description of the basin boundaries, as well as the whole description of of the basin, all of the water informations, water quality information, a lot of very useful information. There's chasm here, and a whole other uh, DW related pieces of information. And also, there's a search function. Type in your address. It'll zoom you right into your house or water agency. And you can see there's the current boundary, groundwater basin boundaries, and cap boundaries, and all these other boundaries. And then, will the listserv provide updates on the GSA notifications? Um, yes. Uh, there, there's five GSAs formed. Uh, I've yet to use that listserv to, to, to uh, you know, buy every one of those particular formations. I have let the, the GSAs that have submitted information know that the information is, is posted. Um, but we're working through a... a um, some distance right now on, on how often we should provide the, those updates. You know, every time one's formed, is it weekly, is it bi-weekly, is it monthly? Uh, but yes, uh, I, I think, especially as more and more are formed as agencies, other local agencies in those those vicinities uh, are, are concerned with that 90-day component of the act. Um, it will, will, will something that isn't, uh, uh, Say, often, but something a notification that's often enough. But if you're definitely interested or, or concerned about GSA formations, you know, the website to look at, bookmark it, check it daily if our, our notification frequency isn't good enough for you. Interesting links. There was a lot of discussion on basin prioritization. There's a link to the initial basin prioritization. Communication and outreach. The Bulletin 18 current version. There is a whole web page based on the Bulletin 118 with all these basin descriptions and a link to the actual PDF version of the report. Their good source of information is the Great Information Center. This has a number of useful links, ground basics, maps, and reports. Another for local agencies to use as your form GSAs and starting to think about your, your groundwater sustainability plan. You had a couple questions come in specific about whether plans are available for download with the layering available for download and will the GSPs, once those are developed, be posted online as well? The GSPs, ultimately, when they are Complete due dates for GSPs uh, January 1st, 2020, for GSPs that are not in a critical um, base of identified as critical condition of overdraft, um, or excuse me, for a that is identified as critical conditions of overdraft, the, the due date is January 1st, 2020. And then January 1st, 2022 is for all other high and medium priority basins. And so the groundwater sustainability building plans, uh, you know, we be posted. So that's the, the one question. The other question is related to the, Real the quick, layers of the tool. Follow up on the groundwater sustainability plans. An example of that is the current groundwater management plan. Those are also available on this water management planning tool. If you click a certain basin to the actual groundwater management plans themselves and plan to have a similar functionality with the groundwater sustainability plan moving forward. 
as to implement these GIS coverages. Right now, it's unavailable, but there are plans for in the future for all this GIS information that represents these boundaries to be able to be downloaded from this website. Are things related to basin boundary characteristics or issues that the group wants to ask? Thank you, Stephen, for the excellent tour of the website and answering those specific questions related to the ground sustainability plans and the maps and layering and ground sustainability agency notifications. Um, if there are no other questions, please go back to the email uh, slide so if people write down if they want to, they haven't already done so. Thank you for everyone's time. We did a cover of information today. As a reminder, we have been recording this webinar and we'll make this available online for people to view later. Um, any last closing thoughts or comments from our panelists? Uh, just wanted to thank you for everyone's time. This is Stephen, and I'd like to echo that. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We appreciate the, the great questions and the comments, and we look forward to seeing you next uh, the required public meetings this summer on the draft basin boundary regulation. Thank you. And this now concludes today's conference. All participants must connect at this time.